thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, oops, hang on. Oops. No. Flash on screen. Okay. Um, right. But one of the most important books in philosophy in the 20th century was, um, wasn't actually written. It was uh, Saul Kripke's Naming and Necessity, which were lectures uh, given in 1970 and published in 1972. Uh, a very thick book on the Somalis natural language. And it didn't appear as a book until 1980 when it appeared with this preface, which clarified a number of issues and demolished certain object objections that were gaining currency in the 1970s. And uh, there's an interesting blend of formal and informal in Kripke, which is something I want to bring out today. In fact, Name Necessity has got a number of uh, facts. There's a number of facts about it, which if you take them together, they um, make it one of the most relevant uh, pieces of literature to the, the general theme of this conference. Um, so and first, it, look, it's, these lectures were given by a person known as a logician at the time. He was 27, I think. And not just any logician, it was a logician who came up with a novel way of handling the semantics of modal systems, become called Kripke semantics, and providing um, the relevant completeness proofs and so on. Um, and the second thing is work on necessity has always has been formal since about 19, well, at least since the 1940s, but probably earlier with, with C.I. Lewis. And the third thing is, um, well, second, it's, so it's, it's a very technical field, studies of necessity in philosophy, but Kripke actually gave these lectures without any notes and what's important, very little formalism, okay? Now, it's not that Kripke doesn't know how to do the formalism, Kripke obviously knows how to do the formalism, but he, could, he was able to present these ideas without very much formalism. Uh, in fact, the footnotes, the rest of the formalism is actually the footnotes, which were added on after the fact. And, um, the philosophy in Naming Necessity actually illuminates some of the earlier formalism, as becomes clear if you read the, the preface to this and a, a couple of papers by John Burgess. Now, there's been some misunderstandings, I think, in the literature about the relationship between the logical and linguistic assumptions that Kripke makes there and the metaphysical thesis that he defended. And I want to dwell on a couple of aspects of this um, in light of this methodological sermon. I'm going to share my screen with you now if I can. Uh, should work. Uh, is that working? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. What's this thing doing? All right. So look, here's this, this quote from Kripke. Um, quite a famous quote by now. Logical investigations can obviously be a useful tool for philosophy. They must, however, be informed by a sensitivity to the philosophical significance of the formalism and by a generous admixture of common sense as well as a thorough understanding both of the basic concepts and of the technical details of the formal material used. It should not be supposed that the formalism can grind out philosophical results in a manner beyond the capacity of ordinary philosophical reasoning. There's no mathematical substitute for philosophy. Now, I take this very seriously. Um, formalism has its place. Um, it's crucial to a number of um, philosophical enterprises, but um, we need to establish just how far one can get with, with formal methods. And I think by reflecting on what they are and what they're supposed to do, we can throw some light on this, um, as well as talk about the interrelated work of formal and informal work on necessity events and facts and in fact the semantics of singular terms. So look there's this history of the 20th century of, of, of um, the idea that if you look at the logic or the use of natural language you can somehow solve or dissolve uh, philosophical problems okay in, in a couple of varieties um, and that idea fell from grace but the residue of the two Repeating approaches to that way of looking at things um, still shapes a lot of um, discussion. Now, one of the original ideas was that the way forward is through the formalization of philosophical claims and arguments in languages uh, based on the formal languages studied by logicians, um, which are supposed to invite clarity and offer the means to test for consistency. And the second method was in it 
in, in effect, the complete opposite. Um, it was the careful analysis of ordinary usage, linguistic usage. And this, it was claimed, was going to reveal deep differences um, between the meanings of sentences of formal languages, if that even makes sense, that notion of meanings of sentences of formal languages, and I'm with Kripke on this, I'm not sure it even does, uh, and the relationship between those and the meanings of sentences of natural language, so, you know, Wittgenstein, Moore, Austin, Strauss, and other Oxonians. But what actually happened in the light of these two things is something which was already happening in science quite generally, I think. We start off with some question that we express in natural language, you know, um, that it can involve a word like space, time, justice, knowledge, meaning, courage, necessity. Um, and as we examine these questions over the years, we realize that we need some theoretical vocabulary because we realize that we're now in a realm where we may want the meanings of the terms within the theory to diverge from meanings of terms in natural language. Um, so we begin with the original meaning of a word like space or time or events as the intuitive meaning as it were. And over time we become more sophisticated and we, we, we let go of ordinary usage. But it's better than not let go. We're not held hostage to it uh, in the way that many people in the 20th century seem to be. Now with some words, there seems to be a, a bit of a risk with this. Uh, I'm, put, I'm gonna put up on the screen now. Um, so look, um, someone might propose that the words knowledge and know should be used in philosophy so as to accord with the analysis in K1, right? S knows that P just in case S believes that P and S's belief that P is justified. Fair enough. Um, we might disagree with this, but nobody's gonna say it's changed the subject matter, right? It's still about knowledge, it would seem, even if you think this is not quite right. Uh, with K2, it's very different. Uh, you would be very suspicious of K2. S knows that P, just in case P, S believes that P, and S used to believe that not P. You think, well, that's weird. That's not knowing that P. That's something like coming, coming to believe that P, or coming to know that P, or something like that. It's not really knowledge. That's coming to know something like that, or close to. Um, well, it seems, so it seems to be a bit of a departure from the subject matter. And of course, with something like three, S knows that P just in case P, S believes that P, and S's mother hopes that not P, you just walk away. So this, you're not, you're not talking about what I'm talking about. That's not knowledge, okay? What your mother hopes is not part of that knowledge. And so the question is, you know, how far can you go? One seems fine, K2, K1 seems fine, K3 seems completely bizarre. K2, well, you can sort of see what somebody's up to. It's wrong, but it's not crazy but K3 is nuts, okay. Now with the word meaning, we're in a very curious uh, situation, I think. There are some people who simply maintain that meaning, the meaning of a sentence is truth conditions, the meaning of a singular term is whatever it refers to. And there are others who maintain that we can uh, do no better than just ask for how do people actually use this word on a given occasion. Um, but then I think there are those who really follow the scientific method and I, I think, Chomsky, Kripke, and Grice fall into this category. They start with some ordinary word like mean or refer or sentence or pronoun or say, and you move forward with those words until you reach a breaking point within the theory. They seem to be shaking a bit. They don't seem to fit in with the rest of it. So you say, aha, we need to step back slightly. This is what got us going in talking about sentences and pronouns, languages, meaning, reference, saying, and so on. But now things we have to sort of refine our usage and the theoretical um, terms start to deviate from uh, ordinary usage. Uh, and um, we want to form an integrated vocabulary of terms within a theory. So, I mean, a, a very simple example of this would, would be, um, let's take Grice's an example, um, analysis of saying. Uh, you know, on Grice's view, speaker meaning is the basic notion of meaning, and he gives an analysis which may or may not be on the right track. But then he he defines the notion of saying to say that P, what it is for someone to say that P in terms of meaning that P. That is, on his account, you can't say that P unless you mean that P. Okay, so the, there can be no like, well, that's what he said, but not what he meant. That's we say that sort of thing all the time in ordinary talk. That well, that's what he said, but not what he meant. On Grice's technical use of saying, you can't 
say something you don't mean. Because saying that P is meaning that P in a certain way that's connected with the language, okay? But you explicitly announce this fact that you're departing from ordinary usage because you think this is the notion that's going to fly in the empirical theory of what you're trying to, what you're trying to, what you're trying to, uh, the, the, the phenomena you're trying to describe or capture or explain. So it just seems to me this standard method that, uh, I mean, the sort of unthinking method, if you like, in the sciences, which has taken hold in some parts of philosophy of language, but not all. And I think we can um, make this a little more concrete now if we think about the difference between logic and semantics. So there's certain pitfalls can be avoided, I think, um, if we specify in advance the difference between the logical properties of an expression and the semantic properties of an expression, natural language, in anything that deserves to be the theory of meaning of that language. Now, logic, it's the systematic study of consistency and validity. Now, if semantics is the study of meaning, then logic and semantics aren't the same thing. One's about consistency and validity, one's about meaning. Okay. But of course, that doesn't mean there's no role for logic in theorizing about meaning. And that role is really elaborated as carefully and as explicitly as it should be. And a consequence of this is the persistence of several wrong-headed, intellectually debilitating ideas about the relation between theories of meaning and formal ontologies of such things as facts, events, propositions, states of affairs, and so on. So logic concerns, concerns itself with preserving truth, not meaning. And that fact is missed by anyone claiming for example, that a, a particular proof uh, is invalid if it's not meaning preserving. And some objections to versions of the slingshot argument are based on showing that as a step in the argument that's not meaning preserving, irrelevant when it's set out as a logical deduction. Invalidity is shown by showing that something's not truth preserving. Okay, now this fact is sometimes obscured by the fact that the word semantic gets used in two different ways. Um, the sort of original usage, it's a label for certain empirically discoverable properties of expressions and grammatical constructions in natural language uh, investigated by um, that branch of empirical linguistics that we call semantics. But it's also, and this is really, I suppose, Tarski's fault, it's the label for a narrow technical technically defined class of properties stipulated to hold of expressions in formal languages, right? So there's empirically discovered properties of natural languages and stipulated properties holding expressions in formal languages, specifically stipulated denotation relations between symbols and the entities of a stipulated universe, okay? Um, now, these are used to provide truth definitions for those languages, and they're studied in a more general way, and that branch of mathematical logic we call model theory or formal semantics, which is the use of semantics which differs from the use in empirical semantics, semantics of natural language. And this, this one studies the relations in question by means of set theoretic structures, and they may or may not be appropriate for thinking about meaning. Okay. Now, here's just a really simple example. Um, I should have this on the handout here. Right, so sentence L1, snow is white and grass is green, therefore grass is green, okay? And snow is white or grass is green, therefore grass is green, L2. So, you know, L1 is, seems actually fine, we'd, we'd agree with that, uh, we, but L2 is not. Now, it's the difference in the meanings or the semantic properties of and and or that explain this contrast, right? And and or don't have the same meaning, uh, they don't have the same logical properties, as it turns out, and that's what explains this logical contrast. The logical properties are constitutively determined by the semantic properties of an expression's immediate constituents and immediate syntax, and the logical properties are simply a um, subset of the um, semantic properties. Those semantic properties that bear on validity and consistency, those that bear on truth and falsity. You go beyond truth and falsity and you're outside the realm of logic proper, which is about uh, validity and consistency. Um, now, uh, there's no reason to think 
that if you could, if you fix an expression's logical properties and you narrow down to uniqueness the range of acceptable theories of its semantic properties, um, that you've identified the meaning of the expression with its logical properties. And the way one easy way to see this is to compare the meaning of and and but. So look at L3. Snow is white, but grass is green. Therefore, grass is green. Okay, now that's just as valid as L1, but it has the word but in it, and but and and don't have the same semantic properties in the empirical sense of semantic properties. Have the same logical properties, which many people want to call its only semantic properties. Let's resist that because there's no reason to specify in advance that the validity uh, relevant properties of an expression exhaust its semantic properties, except in the stipulated task in sense of semantics. You know, I was talking to Kripke about this and his papers are semantical considerations on modal logic. He says, it's really the wrong title. You know, we just all bought into this task in use of the word semantical. And it's really, this, you know, it's, a, it's a model theoretic or formal semantical, uh, not semantic in the ordinary sense. And unfortunately, I think that's been missed in a lot of the linguistics and philosophy literature. Um, now, the ice cuts both ways. Just the logician can't claim to have specified the meaning of expression just by virtue of having specified the totality of its logical properties. I'm talking about the expression of English now, and we identify the logical properties. That's not the same thing as, uh, uh, as specifying its meaning. But on the other hand, the logician doesn't need to specify the meaning of expression in order to specify its logical properties, because some of these meaning prop semantic properties may have no logical repercussions. So take the word but. It's not incumbent upon the logician to worry about the difference between and or but, because they have the same logical properties. It can be completely ignored, because truth preservation is all we care about. Now, um, quite different intuitive meanings are compatible with the logical properties an expression has. So, and could easily mean, you could, you could, um, you could something with the logical properties of and could mean what but means. Uh, it's just that and doesn't mean what but means. Uh, but all this shows is that you can have the very same expression with a certain set of logical properties, you have not uniquely found its meaning. And this is, comes out specific, very clearly, I think, in um, the properties of um, the, the modal operator, box, box and diamond, let's just focus on box, in a particular uh, modal system, maybe compatible with all sorts of intuitive notions of necessity. Um, that is um, a single understanding of box as expressing logical or analytical or metaphysical or physical or nomological, causal, economic, deontic, whatever, moral necessity uh, or provability or verifiability, whatever it is. It's not constituted by the accessibility relation in a given system of modal logic, right? Various modal notions are compatible or incompatible with various modal systems. And so look, it's widely held that something like S5 is the appropriate system for logical necessity uh, in the sense of validity, but there's nothing about S5 itself that makes box mean it's logically necessary that. It's nothing that makes it mean what it is logically necessary that means for us, okay? So the baseline conceptual relation between logic and semantics is just that the logical properties of an expression are a subset of its semantic properties. Uh, but they're important because obviously the logical properties constrain the semantic properties. So if you, you can't as assign the logical properties of or to a word like but, but is much closer in meaning to the word and than it is to the word or because of the sharing of a crucial uh, logical property. Now, I want to look at Quine's um, attack on modal logic and the sort of formal and informal response to this. I'll just put this up in advance. So, um, when Quine attacked uh, quantified modal logic, and this was a long time before the models for these systems were put forward by Kripke, um, the critique was of systems in which the necessity operator is understood as expressing logical or analytic necessity. And in it's the quantified setting, the crucial point concerns the intelligibility of this operator. 
not the absence of any model theory. Okay, the intelligibility of the operator. Model theory is only going to get you so far. So to the extent that people have assumed a tight relation between model theory and intelligibility, um, equivocations involving the words interpretation and semantics are plausibly implicated. Now, Quine called the paper the problem of interpreting modal logic, the problem of interpreting modal logic in his 47 paper. And there are two different problems suggested by that title. The first is the, the systems of providing modal logics with interpretations in the logician sense, providing the mathematical structures that can be used to interpret such languages. But there's another problem that's in the intuitive sense of interpreting, that is understanding where what box is, is actually expressing by it's logically necessary that, or it's analytically necessary that. And those problems are quite different. There's the interpretation in the logician sense and interpretation in the sort of semantic intelligibility sense. Um, so th this could create the illusion that technical results answer all questions about intelligibility. And that's some simply false. I mean, Kripke solved the technical problem of interpretation of this, but it's unclear that the intelligibility problem was solved for logical and analytic necessity. For different notions of necessity, sure. Um, so what you don't get is that, um, what you don't get is simply the accessibility relations, you know, transitivity, reflexive symmetry, and so on. That those by themselves aren't going to fix uh, what the meanings of these expressions are for two reasons, right? The first reason is something which I think is underappreciated. Um, formal systems don't mean anything. They have no meanings. They are systems of shuffling symbols around and allowing certain combinations of symbols to follow from other combinations of symbols, and then you declare this to be valid or invalid. They don't have meanings per se. All the expressions have the logical properties that you stipulate them to have, and you can draw conclusions about the logical properties of other expressions in this system on the basis of those properties. The word meaning shouldn't really come into the picture. It's not to belittle logic, of course, because the idea is you can carry some of this over to natural language, so you can look at arguments in natural language and establish whether or not those arguments are valid. So that was the rationale for taking logic so seriously in the semantics of natural language and in philosophy more generally as giving us the tools for transferring the properties of expressions in a logical system to exploring whether those properties hold of expressions of natural language and then exploring the validity of arguments in natural language. Now, I want to just point, here's the, here's the problem with understanding box in the way uh, that uh, people wanted to understand it in the 40s and 50s uh, in a quantified modal system if it's expressing logical analytic necessity. And the way to see this is, is just contrast that understanding of one and two up on the board there. There exists some x such that not fx and a is identical to x versus there exists some x such that box fx and a is, oh, that should be not, that should be identical to that. But I don't know how that box got there, two different fonts. On number two, the little box should actually be an identity sign. This one, yeah, that should be identity. Okay, now I'll just run through this because it's, 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 it's interesting. Um, so following Tarski, forget talk of sequences of objects because we're, we're only focusing on one variable here. So we don't need you know, X1, X2, X3. We just say that one is true uh, if and only if one prime, that is to peel the quantifier off, is satisfied by or true of at least one object O. If one, or at least one object satisfies one prime, then we say that one is true. And we say that one prime is true uh, of an object O if and only if, um, whoops, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It, it, we say that uh, one prime is, if and only if three is not true of O, that is that Fx and A is X don't hold of an object O, okay? And so on. So we've got, we now know how to, we know how to get fx is true, just in, it's true of an object just in case it's f, and x is identical to a, is true of, of an object just in case it's identical to a, right? So we see how to build up this. I mean, all this does is show you how the, the negation operator actually works. Now you go to two, and now we seem to be in a bit of trouble. Um, we seem to need to say that two is true if and only if two prime is true of at least one object O, right? 
peel the quantifier off just in case box fx and azx is true of that object. And that two prime is true of an object O if and only if three is necessarily true of O. Back up here, three again. That open sentence fx and azx has to be necessarily true of O. But here's the problem. Um, in the case of the modal logics Quine was attacking in 1947, uh, it's, if it's to be understood as expressing a logical analytic notion, then we need to know what's involved in being logically true of an object. Okay. Um, now, even if we can convince ourselves this involves fx and a, a is identical to x, both being logically true of O, it leaves us asking what's involved in a is identical to x being logically true of O question is a is x logically true of a well a is a is not only true it's logically true so four is true if box is understood as expressing logical necessity box a is a so it must be logically true of a that a is identical to x but suppose that a is identical to b is also true so unlike a is a a is b is not logically true it might be necessarily true in the metaphysical sense but it's not logically true Right. Um, so five is false if box is understood as expressing logical necessity. So four is true, five is false, even though A is identical to B. So it's not logically true. Um, here we go. So it's not logically true of B that it's identical to X. But by hypothesis, A is B. Um, so surely these properties are either true of, an, of the object or not true of the object. So a is X is both logically true of that object and not logically true of that, that object uh, that you've picked out. It seems to depend on how it was picked out, right? It was, so we seem to have no clear conception of what is involved in a formula being logically true of an object. So we have no clear uh, idea of what's expressed by two. And so no um, clear uh, idea of what was expressed by uh, two prime, sorry, so no clear conception of what's expressed by two. Okay. So there's, that's, of course, that's only if the, the notion of necessity you're interested in is logical necessity. You can't just brush aside Quine's objection and say, yeah, but we've done the model theory. That's not uh, the right response. That just reinforces the point that as far as the study of semantics is concerned, it's not clear what a system of modal logic can contribute other than constraints on the uh, semantics of the modal expressions that flow from the, the system's modal operators. So you define a formal system, you give it a model theory, you prove soundness and completeness, but those results don't constitute providing an interpretation in the other sense. You haven't given the meaning of box. The mere existence of the model theory shows only that the axiom systems are formally consistent. The models themselves don't reveal meanings, but if you carry them over, if you carry them over to natural language, they seem to place constraints on possible meanings that you want to um, apply. Now, Smolian had this interesting um, response. I'll get to Kripke's quote in just a minute. Smolian had this um, interesting response. He said, look, uh, maybe ordinary proper names, which are represented by individual constants in the formal system, should be regarded as Russellian proper names and uh, essentially um, making the bearers synonymous, the direct reference, essentially. So, Smullyan suggested, what if we had a logically proper name theory of, uh, of these constants, a, a direct reference theory, essentially, that would make six true uh, whenever A and B are named. If A is B, then necessarily A is B. And that, that makes every true statement involving names logically necessary. It's an idea that Marcus took up later. Um, though she didn't even have uh, individual constants in her system. Um, now, so this is a bit of a worry, but, and this is where Kripke comes in, and of course it's not announced exactly, but if you take box to express a different notion of necessity, uh, then uh, there's nothing wrong with, with certain notions of necessity. So anyone who wants to construe box today as expressing a metaphysical notion will not face the specific inter interpretive difficulty just raised for logical necessity. On a metaphysical conception of necessity, we can say seven. A is identical to X is necessarily true of A, metaphysically necessarily true of A. If A is B, then A is X is also necessarily true of B. 
So box A is B is true. Um, look, uh, that's not the end of the story. Anyone who proposes to interpret box as expressing metaphysical necessity needs to say what that notion is. No less than anyone who wants to interpret box as expressing causal or physical or ethical or economic necessity. It's okay to say, aha, we've got a model theory for a system and we've got an interpretation um, that makes it uh, that unproblematic interpretation. But as yet, you still need to say, what is, what's the notion you're talking about? What is this notion of metaphysics? It's clearly not the same thing as physical or eth ethical or economic necessity. Um, what, you, what you've got right now is a system and an idea. And Kripke had an idea in name necessity, a metaphysical sort of bedrock notion of necessity in terms of which other notions of necessity may or may not be definable. And John Burgess um, summarizes the point nicely. You see, in, well, let's back up a little bit. If you look at the variables in the, the modal systems Kripke was working at in the late 50s and early 60s, essentially variables under an assignment are rigid relative to that notion of necessity. I mean, it's not, since rigidity is defined uh, in terms of metaphysical necessity, that's not strictly speaking true, but the idea is inherent in there that you need these objects to hang on to objects under assignment across different um, possible world states, states of the world, whatever you want to call them. I don't want to call them possible worlds because it makes it sound like they're the, you know, just, it's this you know, fanciful idea, possible states of the world. So look, Burgess summarizes this situation very nicely. Here's what he says. As regards modal predicate logic, Kripke's early mathematical work in model theory does not settle the disputed issues of interpretation, but rather Kripke's later philosophical work on language and metaphysics is needed to clarify his model theory. His model theory cannot in and of itself settle disputed questions about the nature of modality. But if that's its weakness, it has a correlative strength. Not being bound by any particular understanding of the nature of modality, the model theory is adaptable to many. And of course, that's exactly what has happened. Kripke models and Kripke semantics has been applied across the board to all types of modal systems used to model different notions of necessity. And what Burgess means by the philosophical work on language and metaphysics is needed is what that work actually shows, what naming necessity really shows is he argues not on the basis of anything to do with logic or any sort of smuggled in precepts about natural language or logic. What he shows is that ordinary proper names must are rigid, refer rigidly. They refer to the same object in every possible world in which that object exists. And if you want to model it using, using, using the model theory of a modal system, uh, it's, it's not gonna work unless you respect that. You're not gonna get the right results. And moreover, the variables under assignment have to have the same property. So naming necessity actually clarifies the way individual constants are going to have to work in a modal system that satisfies your favorite constraints for being systems of certain types. Okay? So that's what Burgess means by the philosophical work, clarifies the model theory. The model theory itself can't do that, right? You need some specifications of what it, what's going on. Right, so back to logic and semantics again. Um, and let's leave that for a minute. Um, so the fact that the model theory for say S5 doesn't determine a unique understanding of box should be enough to prevent anyone from conflating the model theory for language and a theory of meaning for that language, conflating formal semantics in the sense of model theory from linguistic sense semantics in the sense of a theory of meaning. Um, come back to that in a minute, but first I want to very quickly talk about events and maybe about facts. Right, so when does this type of formalism have its place in philosophy? Obviously, if you're talking about modality, um, it, can, it can be extremely useful because you might find out that the properties of moral necessity, it has different logical properties from metaphysical necessity or physical necessity or causal necessity. And there's lots and lots of different modal systems, not just like S4 and S5, S4.2 and lots of different modal systems which you might want to tweak in order to capture the logical properties, not the meanings, the logical properties of certain expressions used to express notions of necessity that themselves need to be clarified. It's up to the economist to clarify what economic necessity is. It's up to the ethicist to clarify what's meant by ethical necessity. It's up to the metaphysician to talk about, what we, to explain what's meant by metaphysical necessity, as far as I know it hasn't been explained properly yet. Uh, 
Uh, and it's up to the physicist to say what physical necessity is, okay? Now, the relationships between all of those uh, notions and metaphysical necessity is an interesting one. But having the right model theory for this just means you can shunt the symbols around and not come out with any mistakes. You haven't said what physical necessity is and how it differs from causal necessity. You know, maybe physical necessity and causal necessity, uh, the same modal system actually fits them both. Maybe not. And then, of course, there's issues with tense logic too. I mean, nobody's going to say that that tense is the same thing as, as necessity uh, or mod a modality like that. Uh, yes, it seems that um, for tense logic, some modal systems seem to, done with cryptic models, seem to capture what we want. Right, so where do these act things actually come in? Well, look, let's take um, Davidson on events. Davidson says 11. For any x, x, x and y, if x is y, x, x is y, if and only if x and y have the same causes and effects. Okay, now, this is sort of gratuitous formalism here. You can say that in, in English perfectly well. Okay. Two, two events aren't really two events, they're really just one event, identified in terms of its causes and effects. Okay, this is an easier way to put it, I suppose, but you know, when are two things not the same, never, when are two things the same as each other? Well, if they're the same thing, always. Okay, but so anyway, this is the way you usually state this type of thing. And of course, there are immediate issues here because um, causes and effects are usually taken to be events too. So it's not as if this is giving you identity conditions for events. Uh, well, it's giving individuation conditions. It's giving you identity conditions. It's saying when, in fact, you must be talking about the same thing. It doesn't tell you what they are. Now, people have thought of this as a definition of what events are, when really at best it can be a true statement about events. Right? Tells you when you're gonna when you've really got one event, um, when when you've actually got two events. This gives you a way of doing that. Okay. Um, now there's a, another Quine's way of doing this is a bit different. And Quine, this was actually before Davidson uh, came up with this causal theory uh, of a uh, way of individuating events. Um, Quine went for a spatio-temporal location story. Okay, so. Two events aren't in fact two events, they're one event if they are occupy the same spatio-temporal location. Again, you can say this without quantifiers and so on, but there's a simple way of saying it. Now, um, all sorts of problems with both of these. Um, the, the formalism doesn't matter much. Um, it doesn't tell us whether facts, uh, whether facts can be causal or not. So let's look at the first one. And, and uh, yeah, it doesn't tell us whether facts can occupy spatial temporal locations. And it doesn't tell us whether facts can be causes and effects, the first one. So it's not as if it's, you have to specify in advance for any X that's a fact and any Y that's a fact, they're the same fact, just in case they have the same facts as causes and fa uh, events as causes and effects as causes, right? So if you explicitly specify that you're restricting attention to events, all well and good, but of course that doesn't tell you what the events are, okay? And similarly with, uh, with Quine's 12, though there are some things you can actually um, do there where for any, uh, oh, that for all R, it's just a region of space time. So X is Y, if and only if X and Y have the space, same spatial temporal location, that is occupy R the same. Now, of course, what you can do is, and what how people have done is, um, is modalize these, but before, just getting to the, the modalization. Let's just just be clear again what 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 this what we haven't got here. They, neither of these tell us whether there are things other than events that can be causal relata. It also doesn't tell us whether we can mix mix and match. Uh, if if facts are causal relata, suppose we allow that x and y to range over facts as well as events. It doesn't tell us whether an event can cause a fact, a fact cause an event, or whether only events cause events, or whether only facts cause facts. That would have to be sorted out too. So there might have to be some sort of cross-term restrictions or something like that, uh, making causal relata of the same type of entity, for example, maybe not. Now you could offer both 11 and 12 as true. Um, I suspect they both are true. Um, in fact, something stronger in a minute. Um, and at that point, things might become useful now because having a, whenever you bring in your causal operator and start talking about causal relations and you bring in your spatio-temporal operators now, now there's going to be some interesting interaction. And when you have two very different types of modal operators interacting, now you've got some very serious constraints 
uh, emerging. But what happens when you're within the scope of two of these modal operators, one's uh, inside the other, and it's a different type of modality. All sorts of interesting things need to be, and they haven't been sorted out yet as far as I can tell, and um, they need to be. But here's um, where the formalism might be slightly more useful. Um, people have, have put forward these types of theories, X, uh, Y, if and only if X and Y necessarily have the same causes and effects or necessarily have the same spatial temporal location, right? In every possible world, they have the same causes and effects. And in every uh, possible world, they have the same spatial temporal location. Now, look at 12. That might strike you as an odd, I actually think, I think, I think 11 and 12 are both, in fact, true, but that's not the point right now. You might think, look at it, um, wait a minute, it's the same spatial temporal location. The Battle of Waterloo, right? Somebody, somebody like David Lewis come along and say, surely the Battle of Waterloo could have taken, started and ended 10 minutes later than it actually ended. So 12 is clearly false. It's simply not, not true of the Battle of Waterloo that it has its spatio temporal properties, essentially. To which I want to say, look, um, if that were the case, there would have been a battle at Waterloo that happened 10 minutes later than the actual Battle of Waterloo. It wouldn't have been the Battle of Waterloo because the Battle of Waterloo took place when it did. But we would have called it the Battle of Waterloo because that was the battle that took place in that particular location in Waterloo back, back then. But it wouldn't have been the Battle of Waterloo. But in the language of that world, we would call it the Battle of Waterloo. So that's not a... That's not a problem. I was talking about a different set of, uh, a different language in that case. So I don't think there's a real problem uh, with that type of thing here. Um, finally, I want to talk very briefly ab about facts. Uh, so my phone's going, but I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, um, so facts, I, I was going to have a long piece on this, but I realized that time's running short, so I can't really do this. So here, there is a testing procedure. A, um, you can think what a slingshot argument, right? Now, what, what exactly is a slingshot argument? Well, it's a filter. It's, it's, a theory, it's a filter on theories, right? So you take your favorite formal theory of events or facts or whatever it is, and you examine the logic of the, uh, of the operators in that system. And in a very seemingly innocuous way, you look at equivalence conditions for sentences and, and, and terms in that logic, and you see if a certain type of damning conclusion follows that makes it the case, for example, that the operates in question turn out to be extensional, which would be bad if you've got a system which is trading on having non-extensional uh, operators. Now, we know plenty of uh, non-extensional operators that work, so it, it, this is, it, it can't be what Quine wanted it to be, this type of thing, a, a complete way of demolishing the very idea of non-extensional operators. We know that's not going to work because metaphysical necessity works perfectly, okay, on the assumption that we've got some idea of what we're talking about. Even for physical and causal necessity, it's only these linguistic -y notions where it seems to create a problem, okay? Um, in a modal system like uh, we have for that we use for metaphysical necessity, it's simply true that equivalent terms that is it uh, can be substituted for one another. Um, that, that is, if we're talking about individual constants, not if we're talking about descriptions, which brings in various types of ambiguity. So, when you built such a, a, a slingshot and, and and differentiated assumptions versus premises versus um, the slingshot deduction versus the sling the proof or the argument that you base on the deduction, uh, they're very, very useful filters for looking at theories of, anytime you've got something that a sentence is supposed to stand for, for example, uh, you can test the operators out uh, and find out whether in fact those, those things like facts or whatever, really are the things that sentences can stand for. But that will force you to say things about facts themselves. In the same way that the theory of events, it's forced, even if you've got all your formalism correct, you've got a nice formal theory of events, doesn't really tell you much until you say what sort of things these events are. The formal system that you use, the formal event logic, doesn't tell you what events are any more than Davidson's or Quine's theories tell you about what events are. Okay, And many theories of facts don't tell you what facts are until they are spelled out with, it, with enough more detail. Um, moreover, it looks as if some of them actually can't satisfy the basic logical criteria that are needed, slingshot arguments for sure. The point is the moral is the same in all this. You can't, with your formal machinery, say what necessity is, any type of necessity, what it actually is. You can't say what an event is. You can't say what a fact is. But you can 
with the help of formal systems and various types of filters, technical filters, narrow down the range of intelligible theories, that is the range of consistent theories. That is the role of uh, formalism, it seems to me, in, in technical philosophy and in philosophy more generally. It's a filter on theories. Um, that's basically what proof theoretic stuff does. Model theoretic, uh, well, look, in a way they do the opposite thing, right? Model theory and the proof theory. But the point is you've, got, you've now got your filters on consistency and that's the value of formalism in any type of philosophy. But Kripke's maxim um, at the beginning is, 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 you know, is absolutely right. You have to know uh, it's not enough to simply have the formal system, right? Uh, logical investigations have got to be informed by a sensitivity to the philosophical significance of the formalism and by a generous admixture of common sense, as well as a thorough understanding both of the basic concepts and the technical details of the formal material. Okay? The formalism itself can't grind out philosophical results. Right? There's no mathematical substitute for philosophy. So I'll leave you with Kripke's words. Thanks.